Hello, and welcome back to Zim Explorer. I am Dr. Abstract, and in this Zim Explorer, we're going to take a look at an app for kids, and we'll go through some code together. Well, let's have a look. This is at uh, zimjs.com slash elearning slash shake. I think it was shake. I'll post the link down below there. So welcome kids. Now the reason why we're doing this welcome message is because we're not allowed uh, in a web app to start sound until the user presses or clicks on, on the app. You can make a, a progressive web app and have the user download that as an app onto their desktop and then when they open that up they won't have the browser bar anymore and you'll be able to play sound right away. But for a normal desktop, uh, or sorry, web app, you'll need to interact. So here we are with a pane in here, and we press. And that will play our sound if we had sound turned on, if we had the music turned on. <laughs> so uh, that's one thing to note. We had remembered the settings of these two things before as well. So let's do a refresh on this and try again here. So in comes a coin to drop, and we are to drop three to ten of these in here. There we go, and then we shake the cup, and they spill out. And the idea is we now count how many blues, one, two, three, four, and how many pinks, one, two, three, and a total, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, we did it! Oh, yeah. So um, this is what we've made, and it was for uh, a friend, a new person who has come along on the Zim, uh, the Zim, what's it called? <laughs> what is it called? This thing, a Slack, the Zim Slack channel, of course. And, uh, oh, here it is over here. So here's the Zim Slack channel. Lori's come on, and she was um, wanting to make one of these uh, number counting things and started one I think she started one in scratch so here here is the scratch version that um, they had going uh, sorry that sound is still going from my other one there isn't it and this was underway what do we have to hit the space bar oh, there we go there it tilted out and in behind here is see inside is a bunch of building blocks that were done in scratch to make this happen and I think each of these things has building blocks on it as well perhaps of different types or maybe copies various animation steps and little things that you can drag around parts there so I don't know too much about sprite let's pop pop that out uh, page and let's turn off our music ah, there we go <laughs> background music uh, this is the the zim version and we may have gone a little bit overboard perhaps uh, in the animations and the spinning and the colors it's up to 10 of them there and when we press this to shake and spill out we can also sort them so there they are now sorted it's a little bit easier to see that there's four and six and way and if we want we can again. Yay! so uh, let's go in and take a look through the code as we were building this we were aware of two things. One is, uh, Lori, I don't think, has done much coding in Zim, is, is new to Zim. So we were wanting to help her see how to code apps like this. And we were also um, aware that we were possibly in comparison to the complexities in Scratch, like which one would be easier, which one's not. We've done a number of uh, features, like a little Angry Birds type game, in Zim versus in Scratch, and it appears that Zim can be simpler. 
but at the moment it's not really comparing apples to apples in terms of the app because we did go sort of all out to complete the app in a variety of ways and added bells and whistles so it ended up like i said uh, being i think more complete or more complex than we had intended initially we thought we would just show how to drop some things into a cup and spill uh, but instead we've added sounds and various controls to do things. We've matched the numbers. Anyway, like I said, yeah, if we did say we were going to go to some code, you're probably all waiting to get into this code. So here we are. This is the Zim template, which you can get at the code page. Uh, here's Zim. And hit code like that and hit copy. That copies the template. Uh, this might not be the exact template, but it's something similar. We're bringing in CreateJS and Zim. Zim is powered by CreateJS, which gives us a bitmap object model for the canvas. A bomb. Inside of here, we are going to bring in our assets. And for these assets, there's a, a goodly number of them down here. We could have made this with a loop, all of these numbers here. But uh, we also have the asset manager, or what is it? I can't remember. I don't think it's asset manager, no. Let's see, where do I want to go? Oh, see Daisy, desktop reveal. This is not where I want to go. Oh, it's way over here. Okay, my apologies. I was thinking that we just go back and see our browser. Um, under code again, after the template, down below just a little bit further are tools and in tools we have the asset list that's it so asset list will allow you to browse any directory on your computer and then you select the files that are in there and it will make this thing for you right here it makes all of this stuff in that order uh, it doesn't make the font like that so when we if we want to bring in the font we need to do that custom but all these things uh, were given to us in that manner those are all in the assets folder. Don't forget though to bring them into the frame. So sometimes it's easy to say, oh, there's all my assets. I can start using them. To use an asset, it would just be like this. Asset and then the name of the asset from something like this. Dot center. And there it is on the stage. So that represents the bitmap, the picture and we're centering it on the stage like that and that would put the cup asset on the stage. So sometimes it's nice and easy to see them here and just want to use them right away but there's one extra step and that is we need to load this, this is just an array, we need to load that into the frame. So take a look, there it is right there, assets and the path that they're in. So we almost always have these guys because that's really part of the template, that's our backing colors and our width and height and the type of we're fitting to the, the stage. The next parameter is the assets and then if an optional path if you want. We're also passing in a waiter because we've got sound. This is These are sounds. Because we've got sounds it may take a little while to load or a little longer to load than if we just have a few images. So we're passing in a waiter and we're matching the waiter's background color to our app color. So don't just sit there and add a waiter, new waiter, that's easy enough, hey. But that's always orange. If, you're, if your app doesn't have orange in it, you may not want it to be orange. Just have a little bit of pride. Get a, get a different color. I've seen too many orange waiters out there. Why do, why, why do we even choose orange as our default you know, color, go-to color? But anyway, uh, it is. So go ahead and change that color if, if you want. We can also pass in a progress bar in a very similar way. The progress bar is either round by default or it's a long bar by, um, if you put in, I don't know, type rectangle or something like that, or bar. So you can do a progress bar as well, and that actually keeps track of how much is loaded. If you're not too worried about that, uh, the waiter is just three little dots that go do 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 and it just repeats until it's loaded. Usually we can get away with the waiter these days, but if you do have a lot of assets, you maybe could consider the progress bar. All right. So here's our, our frame, or 
there was our frame. So, so where's our frame until I clicked on <laughs> the collapsing of the frame? There's our frame. So we've made a new frame, frame.onready. So when we're ready, then when those assets have loaded, when we've made the stage, we're all ready to go. We call this arrow function. What the heck? There we go. Arrow function or a function literal. It doesn't really matter. Anonymous function. We're saying uh, Zog is the way that we console.log, short little console.log in there. You can also console.log different colors like red or blue or green by putting a little letter there. That's handy. And your console is F12. F12 to C console, which is actually in, we mentioned this right in the template, but like I said, I don't think this is quite the real template. This is, um, the way I work in Atom is I, make a new file and I just go temp and it starts to it's a hot key for my template and then it's a sort of a reduced minute like a, a smaller template. We're keeping local variables of stage, stage width and stage height. Just watch it if you are doing the full mode you want uh, to use let here probably because the stage width and stage height might change in your resize event. Anyway so sometimes in the template we make stage constant because that hardly ever changes and then um, just automatically set those even though in the fit mode those won't change and they can be constants if you happen to go to the full mode you would want to use let and then we're grabbing the width and the height so this is all considered part of the template here's our intro um, we can't move we can't play sound as mentioned so we're going to create a pane this is a nice easy way to do it there's a new pane. We're, in this case, making it stretch past the stage. And we make that a little bit bigger than the stage so that the, the background shadow doesn't get, um, doesn't show uh, its little corners, that is. So this is the pane. Shall we see this? Boop, boop, shake and spill. There it is. And you see this background shadow along there? Uh, this pane is going kind of off the stage so that we um, see that that's like a straight line going right across. Panes work by, they'll automatically close if you click on them or click off them. So there you go, either, either one is fine. We do want to run a show and panes are a little bit different than most display objects in Zim where we do a dot center or a dot add to dot loc or dot pose. Those will all place something on the stage or in a container. But the pane is a bit different because the pane also includes not, not just the pane itself, which is here, but it comes with a backdrop that is darker. So you see when we click off, this is darker back here, and then it goes lighter. And panes are usually used in the app to pop up, like it's a little pop-up window, and it, it darkens the things in the background. And you can set them so that they are modal or you know don't allow you to click off them until you click a button. You, you can make a pane with a close button. It comes with a close button if you want. You can make it so that it clicks on it or clicks off. You can drag the pane. Like there's a variety of different pane settings. <laughs> pane settings. <laughs> I like using pane. It's fun. <laughs> I like pane. <laughs> All right. Um, when we close that, we get an event. So pane.onclose, we're going to go ahead and make our app. Uh, because we never even use the pane again, we could have possibly chained on the dot on method, but you're not really supposed to chain dot on methods. That would work. The thing is, and then we wouldn't even need this anymore. It'll all be in one line. It would show it, and then it would add an event. But in adding the event, this returns the ID, the ID function of the event so that we can turn off that event if we ever want to. It does not return the pane object. So if we went const pane here is equal to that, this would not be the pane object. It would be the result of that event in a sense, or well, not the result of the ID function of the event. So generally, we do not chain the on method. So even though we could have and, and not stored it, I decided not to because it's um, it's dangerous. If you know what you're doing, go ahead. But if you don't know what you're doing, then it's usually better to keep your on as an unchained method. All right, on comes from create js. It does not return the object. We can't chain it, or we're not supposed to chain it. Okay, 
So anyway, we call make app, and here's the make app. And in here somewhere, we're going to play our sound. Where's some sound? Here's some sound right here. Uh, it looks like uh, more than, you know, to play the sound is, is not very much at all. We're in the app. We could have said asset, because that's what it is. Quote background dot mp3 dot play. And if you want it to loop, um, I think it's the volume is next. So this is the volume. We actually want to play that at a lower volume and then true for loop. Like that. So that would be playing a background. However, we decided ra rather than just playing the background automatically, we decided to let the user say they want music or they don't want music and they want sound or they don't want sound. So it's kind of a two, two part thing, music or no music. Because the teachers may want to have this happen, but they don't want the music going on as they're talking. So they might be talking. However, they do still want the sound effects. These lovely sound effects. <laughs> it's funny. I made this uh, app called Gobstop a long time ago. It was a game called Gobstop, and these are the sounds that I found on the web. Uh, I have no idea where, and thank you very much whoever made those sounds, but this was like ages ago, back in flash time. And I've reused those sounds quite a lot. They're these sort of just neat, 8 bitty kind of sounds. <laughs> funny, huh? So anyway. I've done a few apps and, and reused reused those. So we didn't want to play the sound right away, and that's why we did some local storage, as, as described in here. Why don't we come back and take a look at that in just a second. But the reason why we did this whole intro in the first place was so that we interact, so that then we can play the sound, if indeed we're supposed to be playing the sound. Here's the title. The title initially just started as a label. It's very easy to make a label. There's a label right there. So we could have, uh, oh, with the new, new label, and that would put the, that title right there, shake and spill. We did set the style somewhere, didn't we? Uh, here it is, style Ruben. So we were using the font of Ruben inside of the pane as well. Or you could have, uh, taken this well you can't you can't apply a font here the, the pane is just sort of like a pop-up window alert it doesn't really come with style usually but we can override the, the basic font by applying style like this so uh, labels though certainly have a, a style or a font parameter so we could have added the the Ruben font in the label in other words if we wanted the title that's what it would look like normally hey it's a label there's the text of it. We've got a size and, and even all this stuff. This is uh, Zim V. We didn't really have to do that. We could have just put in the parameters. I think 60 is next and I think font is next. That's great. And then the color. Those are all uh, like that. And we would dot center that or, or wherever put that there. Okay. And that would be the label all simplified. See, not that hard, huh? Um, but we decided that we would animate the label. Ooh, so we're, we're doing something a little bit different here. I'm not sure how much I... All right, okay, there we are. What's I'm doing there? So instead, we're making label letters. Label letters breaks up a label. You can pass in a label, and it will break up the label into different, uh, different labels. Each letter gets its own label. We positioned all of them, though. That this positions all of them, and we can animate them in a sequence. So this is a little sequence saying every uh, 50 milliseconds, start the next animation. So it's basically going to animate each of those letters from uh, minus 200 in the Y, so from up above. So zero is right at the top. A negative is off the screen up at the top. Positive Y is going down. In, in Zim and most uh, most interactive media worlds. So we're animating starting from up top. We're easing with a back out, and that's what gives us it comes down and then goes back up. So if I'm going left to right, it would go left, and then it would come right, and it would come back like that. So that's a back out. 
in 0.4 seconds, and once again we're sequencing them. So let's have a look and see what that gives us here. Yeah, isn't that neat? And here, let's try it again. They drop down from the top, and they sort of come down too far, and then go back up one more time. Nice, huh? It also gives us the advantage of spacing these letters out a little bit. If you do a normal letter, a normal label, you don't have letter spacing. You can't do kerning. But if you do label letters, you can actually specify a certain spacing and even a custom array of various spacing. So you could do kerning. That means if I think that that looks like too big a space right here, or this one, or maybe we should make this a bit bigger in here, then we could do that with custom. Um, a customer array. All right, this one is animating it as well. Watch how it animates in. Wow, that's an elastic out. So that's elastic, and we're also playing a sound there, if indeed we have the sounds turned on. So that's that one. Here is the instruction text. There it is. Backslash n will make a new line. We do have line height is available, just not letter spacing, unfortunately. And a, the default canvas label doesn't have that. And we're animating that in as well. Uh, we're fading it in from an alpha of zero to whatever the current alpha is. Not all animates have froms, but they can be handy. If you place something on the stage where you want it to end up, then animate from off stage or from somewhere else, from an alpha zero to an alpha of one. This ha well, this happens to be an alpha of 0.9. Oh no, alpha of 0.8, and we're animating from a zero to 0.8, and we're waiting. Okay, great, some animation. Now, what about this sound? What are we doing here? We've got two things that we're wanting to remember: is the music on, and is the sound on. So we're storing a variable that will do that for us. We're also checking local storage if it exists, and we're checking to see if we've already remembered whether it's on or off. If we have, if there's a value in there, oh, you know what? Uh, this value, I've got to, we've got to watch it. We're storing true and false, but actually the value in there is quote true quote false. It will be stored as a string or as a JSON, um, a JSON value, a JavaScript object notation. So that's a little bit different than actually true or false. So this is, as long as there's something stored there, whether it's true or false, this will be, uh, that will be true. And then we're parsing whatever's in there. The local storage cannot hold a Boolean. Uh, true, false is a Boolean. It cannot hold a Boolean. It cannot hold uh, an array or an object literal. We have to JSON um, stringify those to store them in there. And we have to JSON parse those. Here they are being parsed in this case, turned back into a Boolean object. So that gets us whether we've uh, had something remembered. And uh, the backing sound, we're going to play the backing sound anyway, but we're going to play it with a volume of zero. That allows us to turn it off and on, and it's just looping away. So we play it no matter what. But if we have remembered the music and the sound, then we're going to fade in the backing sound. Check that out. Normally, you could just say backing sound dot play would be fine. So we could just say, oh, uh, except it's got a volume. So, oh, sorry, backing sound. We can't actually say backing sound.play. We can say the asset.play. Just watch sound. It's a little bit tricky. You can play the sound asset. And what that returns, what this returns, is what's called a CreateJS abstract sound instance. So that's the thing that we can change the volume on. We can set the volume here, but if we want to change the volume later, we have to store it in a variable, the results in a variable. This also allows you to find out if sound is complete. It has an, a complete event. It allows you to change the panning of sound, et cetera, et cetera. So this allows you to interact with the sound afterwards. Otherwise, uh, many sounds we just play. But in this case, we wanted uh, to be able to control this backing sound, turn it off or on. Not only that, look at how we've done it. 
So if we wanted to, down in here, rather than doing the fancy animating, we could have just said backing sound dot volume equals whatever, 0.2 or 1, 1 would be the default. So if, if we both remembered music, as in we want the music to be on and we want the sound to be on, because both those have to be true, then we could just set the volume up like that. But what we decided to do was animate the backing sound to a volume of 0.1, so from 0 to 0.1. in two seconds. So that's like fading up the sound. It's, a, it's not that much extra to do that. And when we click that button so that we don't want a backing sound, we'll, we'll listen to it. We can see hear it animate out as well. So we didn't choose the easy route. We chose an extra couple steps to animate the sound. Now, as mentioned here in Zim Animate, you saw Zim Animate happening. We're chaining the Zim Animate onto the label. A label is a display object. It's something we can see. So display objects have a dot animate method right there. But there's also an animate function right here that is not chained on or not um, dotted to. It's not being run as a method. The backing sound sounds uh, the, the CreateJS sound instance doesn't know about Zim. The CreateJS sound instance does not have an animate method. So we can't go backing sound.animate. Instead, we're using the Zim global animate function and passing in the object to animate. We can pass in an object literal, for instance, a squiggly brackets object literal with a property of age equals 10. And we could animate round brackets that object, just the object literal and change its value over time. Isn't that cool? So the global function can be used to animate prop properties of objects that are not Zim display objects. But if we're animating a Zim display object, then we just use the animate method, such as this title being animated. You can actually use the animate function as well. You could say animate some label and then the properties. And that's how Zim started. Zim started as a library of helper functions for CreateJS. Isn't that neat? So we didn't even have, there, was, there, was, there were no uh, Zim objects like containers and that kind of stuff. We would um, animate CreateJS objects. Uh, we did have a circle, I guess, and and um, event, and, and we would say, and we would drag things as well. Dragging is also a method like that. We would say, drag round bracket circle. Now we can say circle dot drag. Uh, we used to say animate round bracket circle and do change these properties, but now we can say circle dot animate. So in Zim four, Zim version uh, fourth, uh, Zim fourth we introduced the Zim fourth methods. And that was taking all of our functions that were controlling CreateJS objects, and we moved those CreateJS objects into Zim objects. We um, extended the CreateJS objects and made Zim versions of them so that they could take all of those functions as methods, and they're called the Zim fourth methods. There's like 30 of them or something like that. They're very common, center, drag, gesture, move or MOV, all of the short chainable methods, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all right, bit of history. So here we are, if we need to animate a sound, it's not a Zim display object, so we use the animate function. Now let's have a listen to that. So we refresh here. Ready, I'm gonna bring in the music. So it animated up and I'm gonna turn it off. Okay, nice. Little little fades. Uh, aside from the background sound, if we if the sound is on, we want to wait one second and then play the shake sound. We're we're using the shake sound for two things. Uh, we're using the shake sound for the shaking of the cup, and we oh music, and we're also using the shake sound for that. So we just waited a little bit and played the sound as this thing is animating. And then we also shake the cup. This one. Yay. Oh, I'm 
couple bounce sounds to bounce those guys in. One of the problems is, is well, it's not a problem exactly, but it's something you need to think about. As soon as you have sounds for anything, you kind of need sounds for all things. Okay, and there's the, here's the rule. <laughs> if you bring in sound for one or two things and not other things, it's kind of like, yeah, and that even includes a backing sound. So if you have a backing sound or music playing, then you probably need sounds for, for stuff happening. If you have sounds for stuff happening, then you probably need a backing sound. Uh, not always, but uh, usually. And if you have backing sounds for some things, then you need backing sounds for all things. Okay, or not backing sounds. If you have sounds for some things, <laughs> then you, have, you need sounds for all things. Alrighty. So here's the cup. Oh my. How you doing? This has been this has been a Zim Explorer, huh? Are are we exploring together? Is this, this going to be going to be too long? Where are we at on our explore time here? I don't mind if an explorer goes about an hour. I figure you guys can always pause things and come back in a little bit later. Uh, if if you are listening to this and enjoy the explorers, you're welcome to leave a comment for us. It's sometimes like we're putting out all these videos into the ether and hoping that we're going to help people. Uh, it's always nice to hear some feedback. And come on into zimjs.com slash slack and join us there. And we also have a Discord now. If you're a youngster <laughs> or use Discord, find us at zimjs uh, on Discord as well. All right. Here's the cup. So the cup is our asset. We're going to make it a little bit smaller. Oh, that's the cup pick. It's a little bit tricky because we want to put the we want to put the counters, those little round things are called counters. So we want to put the counters here in the cup. So that uh, the reason why is that when we shake the cup like right now, then because they're in the cup, they all get sh shaken together. Not only that, as we tilt the cup, as we rotate the cup, it actually worked pretty well to uh, have these things just animate up. So basically what's happening is these guys are all animating up in the Y to a certain position, but we've at the same time we're rotating the cup. Let's try setting that. Where do we rotate? It's down a little bit. Uh, animate. It would be when we, music and sound, shake. There's shake, and here's spill. So here's the animation of the rotation. Why don't we say, change that to 10 seconds? This one as well, I'll change that to 10. Okay, there we go, and we'll talk about that in just a second. Ready? I have to put at least three of these things in there. Oh, look at that uh, bounce out. So that's a bounce out where it did the bounce. Um, but as you can see, it, it, all these things, these things animated faster. We didn't change the speed of these things animating out. So that was the problem. It, it rotated really slowly and these things all animated out really, really fast. Maybe we should try that. Where, where do we animate the counters out? So here's, here are the counters. We're waiting, props, we didn't even put a time in. No, okay. So the time was default one. We will ch change that to a time of 10, I guess, as well. Let's see what happens now. Ready? <laughs> like in space. Shake in space. Isn't that neat? So do you see how the uh, nesting of that, by putting these in the cup, they all kind of rotate with the spill with the cup and they even bounce with the cup. So as the cup bounces, these things bounce. And it was kind of, yeah, all right. That worked out pretty well. And we didn't have to do much work. So basically we're rotating these things up to a certain point. This cup, looks pretty good. You see how that's flat like that? It's like it's on the ground. Well, here's what the cup would look like normally. 
So what we'll do is we'll take off this cup pick animation. And we almost left it like this, but just decided that we didn't like it. So there is the cup, and as you can imagine, all these things dropping into the cup. Look how the cup looks, you know, nice and square there. But if, if it were on the ground, if this were the ground, we were about to like lift the cup up a little bit or drop these down a little bit so it seems like they're on the ground. And we thought, well, wait a minute. If we did have a flat ground here, what what is this doing sticking up like that? I mean, it's not too bad. It could be a three-dimensional look of it, and, or, uh, you know, who knows. But I kind of thought that maybe it would look better if we just brought the cup itself up. So we already have a container. The container has the cup and the container has these counters. The counters themselves are in a container by themselves, and that allows us to control all of these counters in a group as, as, a, as a container. Um, for instance, we can loop through them and find out what colors they are. That's easy because they're all in their own container. If they were mixed in with the cup, then we'd have to say, okay, well, loop through the whole cup, but ignore the, the actual cup picture, and then everything else is a container. And, you know, that's a bit awkward. So these are in a container, and the container they're in is in the container for the cup, along with the actual image of the cup called cup pick or something. So what we're going to do is we're going to animate the whole of the container cup, the cup container, but then animate the cup picture back 10 degrees. And that's what this is doing right here. So there we are animating the rotation of the cup picture minus 10 degrees over that time as well. Let's take off the slow-mo. The slow-mo. Uh, you know what, we'll leave the slow-mo in one more time because I want to just point out where it's rotating and a little bit about how it's moving. So we refresh here. The, the cup wants to tilt about this corner roughly. So we're not tilting it about the center, then it would just spin on the center. And this is where the registration usually is for a cup picture, would be up in the top left corner. And we certainly don't want it tilting or spinning about here, then the back of the cup would like tilt up out of the out of the picture. So we've moved the what's called the registration point to this corner so that that's where it's tilting from. But if it were to do that, the cup would then be about this long, come out to here and all the stuff would be off the stage. So not only are we tilting it, but we're also animating the the y position, not the x. It looks like it's the x or is it uh, nope, it's the Y position because as we, no, it's the X. <laughs> oh, one or the other. I guess it is the X. So we're moving the X position of the cup. Yes, the cup is rotated. The things inside their Y gets changed to the horizontal. But the, out from the outside of the cup, the X position of the cup is being moved back to here. So let's see. That is right here. The cup's X position is going from the starting position of the cup minus 380. So its starting position is right here somewhere. Well, I guess that's it right there. Now we can see. Anytime we want, we can go cup.outline like this. So you can outline any display object as long as it's on the stage. And this will show us what the cup looks like. There it is. I guess the picture had some shadow on it or whatever. It's some extra space. So there's the registration point and that's where we're rotating about. That's the zero zero inside the cup, but this is the registration point right there. So let's try it. Uh, You see it moving back like that? Bonk, bonk, bonk. Registration point is a snapshot in time, by the way. Or the, uh, sorry, the outline, not the registration point. The outline is a snapshot in time. 
So that's why all that stuff didn't change. Okay, so back up we go then. Oh, bounce sound, animating. Right, what do we animate here? Oh, that's dropping a coin. Note that for each of our sections, we have little titles. So as I scroll back and forth here, if you sort of look at the little titles, and the titles often will mirror a function, but not always. A lot of time I'm using function literals like this right there. So I have no idea that function doesn't have a name. It's in a change event though on the sound object. So when the sound, when this toggle for the, cha the sound, changes we are doing our remembering of things there but anyway we're for main sections i've brought them in here with the title and we were up past the drop and still working on the cup so the cups arrangement is a little bit more complex than it might be we are asking for the cup first and scaling it a bit smaller that will give us a width and a height and we can use that width and height to specify a container of that width and height. We could have also made a container and put the cup right in it, and then the container will take on the width and height of the cup. But as soon as we go and add more of those, um, the counters or the counters into the cup, then the container would take on the size of the cup and the counters. So if you don't specify a width and a height of a container, the container will just grow to fill its whatever is inside it. And we may not have wanted that. We want better control of the size of our container. We're setting registration point on its bottom right hand corner. If the thing is changing its size, the bottom right hand corner might change it. I mean, there's, there, there might be things that will happen. So basically what I'm doing is I'm saying, okay, let's get the right size for the cup. So we're scaling it. And then based on that right size for the cup, we're making a container and we know that container will match the size of the cup. We're then setting the registration point of that container to its bottom right hand corner. We're positioning that um, 100 pixels from the left and 100 pixels from the center. Huh. Uh, down that is yes so down and then 100 down so let's see if uh, pose is wonderful you should definitely be using pose so basically this is saying here it is there's uh, well, I'm gonna start it. I'm still, uh, I took it off darn it was 100 pixels from the left and 100 pixels down from the center what the heck it's not what's which way is 100 so here's the center I wouldn't I wouldn't have said that that was posed 100 from the center let's just have a look here that's what it says, though. Oh, I know what it is. When you're doing the center, yes, that, that, that is correct. When you're doing the center, it's the general shape of it. You would center that. So if we said zero from the center, it looks like this. And let's do an outline on a stuck outline. Usually it's from the, the edge of, of the object that the pose is working, from the edge of the object and from the edge of the screen. So this is 100 from the left. So it takes where the bounds of the object are and is and moves it, bounds are, and moves it 100 from the left. If we said 100 from the top, it would just be 100 from the top. If we say zero from the center, it takes this and kind of centers it right on the center. So there it is. But that was too high. So I wanted to move it 100 down from the center. So it just picks up this thing if it were centered and moves it 100 down from the center. And so that's what this does right here. 100 down from the center. If we said 100 from the bottom, the bottom, <laughs> bottom, it's a nice word. And here it is, 100 from the bottom, 100 from the left. But if we say 100 from the center or middle, 
And by the way, the capital center is the same as quote center. For the longest time, we just had, we would put quotes there. And then other places, other languages, other whatever have constants that you can use like that. So we decided that we would make a constant for these positions like that. So we don't have to use the quotes. Some will even have constants for this and it would be mouse down. Or worse, it would be something like, uh, I don't know, uh, events, event dot mouse down like that. That will happen where an event object has the constants for us. And it's like, okay, why bother? You know, come on, writing that is, you know, harder than just typing mouse down. So we didn't, haven't done it for events yet. Maybe one day, who knows? That seems to be a thing as 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 you grow in time and specificity, <laughs> um, you start adding little features like that. But anyway, at the moment, we don't have all of our events as, as constants. There it is. They're at least all lowercase, not like DOM content lo uh, loaded. I can't remember which one. Do they do that too? I think they do. Anyway, that's the only event that I know of in the JavaScript world that is not all lowercase. And it's like, JavaScript, whoever decided that should be fired. Probably they were fired. <laughs> Mind you, they're open source. But anyway, that's, um, that's another matter in this Explorer. What was here though? Mouse down? Can't remember. Mouse down. Alrighty. Boop, 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 boop. So we've uh, posed the cup. Great. We're recording a start X and a start Y. When you wiggle, when you wiggle something, it's going to randomly kind of position it. And we're wiggling that cup. We're wiggling that cup when we shake it, and it may not end up in the same place that it started. So this is just a way to store its starting position right on the cup has some properties. And we're going to use that to reset the starting position. Probably could have just replaced it. In a, anyway. So now we have the cup pick. We're setting its registration point to the bottom right hand corner as well. So that when we rotate it back, it uh, it's rotating from the same place as the, the main cup container is rotating. So like I said, yeah, some complexities due to a few things that we were wanting to do. We're wanting to rotate the cup within the cup <laughs> to counteract the, the overall rotation. You might be wondering, why didn't we just rotate the cup 80 degrees? Is, is that, are you saying that? Okay, here's why, we'll show you. We did that, obviously, we did that to start. So heading back down to where we were when we spill right here, well, we don't want it 90, we just want it 80. So then don't bother rotating the cup inside back. And so this is, yeah, we, we did this, and here's what happens. I'm not sure where we're at on our speed of things. Might still be in slow motion. Is it still in slow motion? It is. So far, so good. It's fine. But here's the problem right there. So we have not rotated the cup. Like the cup looks great, it's nice and flat, but unfortunately, these are all at 80, 80 degrees rather than 90 degrees down here. <laughs> so it's kind of like, oh crap. Well, what can we do about that? The options were we could have taken these out of the cup and just rotated them on their own. I wasn't even sure if the whole animating vertically and rotating would, would work, but it worked so well, it was like, okay, now I may as well not play fiddle with that. Basically, the solution is to just keep on rotating the container 90 degrees and rotate the picture of the cup back. So that, that was the solution. <laughs> so, that, so that this didn't happen. Obviously, I don't want to be trying to calculate what 10 degrees on all of these things were, so it would be much easier to just say, okay, let's... Uh, Let's keep the cup rotating at 90, or the cup container, and we'll just rotate the little cup inside back. So that's what's led to some of this uh, complexity here. Fun, huh? I'm awesome. Aw, oh, that's sweet. <laughs> Nothing like that when it pops up, huh? <laughs> Thank you, Marat. Right on. Hope you're, hope you're listening to this. You'll see yourself pop up. <laughs> More. 
Okay, uh, go. Uh, do I have to? <laughs> it's like, go, go away. All right, where were we? We're up top here. I might have to break this explore into two parts, huh? <laughs> I'm gonna put you to sleep. There's the title. You don't want to go all the way back to. It's like going back in time. No, no, no. The cup. Okay, so super. Here's the cup, and there's a, there we are making a counter. So, oh, there's one more thing with the cup. So we're setting its registration point, putting it in the cup. Uh, the cup pick dot on mouse down call shake. So when we mouse down on the cup, call shake, shake. A tap would be fine too. Oh no, a tap is not fine. Isn't that interesting? Uh, so we started off with a tap. We have a short chainable tap, and that, that looks really nice. Dot tap, and we just put whatever our tap function is. There we go, we've been fine. So when we tap on the cup, call mouse down, or call shake. You ready? Let's try it. This was user user testing. The user was me. Was, ah, crap, hang on, let me just get rid of the outline. Where did we outline that? Okay, cup is not outlined. Ready? Some user testing. There they are. And then it says, then shake cup. Okay, so here I go to shake the cup. Huh. The cup doesn't shake. Darn. <laughs> Did you catch that? Can you believe it? It actually just, it's a tap. There it is. It taps and it shakes. Oh, we're still in our slow motion. Uh, but we can't actually pick it up and shake it. And people might do that. They go, they might go, okay. And we could have actually made it really shake if we wanted to. We could have let them go ahead and drag that and shake it. You know, that would have just been a cup dot drag here. And then they could do that. So here we go. We're ready. Oh, it might actually do it from, uh, there it is. So <laughs> there's the cup tracking. <laughs> but uh, can you can you tell what's happened? There I am shaking it. I can, I can take it anywhere, which is why we didn't really, you know, want to do it that way. It's like, I can take it anywhere. Not only that, it's like, why the heck didn't the stuff go with it? Because the drag, by default, it drags whatever was pressed on inside of a container. Now, do you see why? We've just picked up not the cup, but actually the cup pick, which is inside the cup, centered on the cup, inside the cup. And that's great, because if you have a container of monsters and you say monsters.drag, it would you could pick up any monster in there and drag it individually. That's the default. If you don't want that, you put uh, all colon true. And so what we've done is added to the drag saying, oh, no, 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 no not dragging the part inside the container, but actually dragging the whole container, please. And that would look like this. So there we've got some things in there. And now the whole container we're shaking. Anyway, we didn't really want to shake the whole container there, but as you can see, it, it, in the shaking, it doesn't, it doesn't actually, um, uh, the tap does not work. Tap means I press down and I press up within a certain area. So I can't be shaking it also within a certain amount of time. So if I pick this thing up and hold it and shake it, that's no good. So we want a mouse down just in case that happens. The mouse down needs to be in an on. So we cannot chain the on on there. Do not chain the on. If you do, uh, well, in this case, it would be fine because it's the last thing on there, I guess. And we've already defined cup, cup pick. But anyway, it's just not a good idea to, to um, chain your on method. It runs into problems at other times. So we don't want the tap. We want the mouse down. And let's see what I mean by that. So we refresh here. We add some things. And remember before, when I picked this up and shook it, it didn't actually flip over, but now I'm going to try again. So I pick it up and I shake it. <laughs> I left the drag on. The right, hang on. Take the drag off. <laughs> Is this a comedy routine? That thing's still bouncing. Okay, so let's try this again. 
So we've taken the drag off and watch. Before, if I picked this up and shook it, it wouldn't actually go unless I added a drag, but we didn't have the drag because the tap wouldn't op operate. But here I'm going to try and pick this up and shake it. And look at that. It, it looked like I was picking it up and shaking it. It wasn't really. It was just because as soon as I moused down to start my dragging, it, it went ooh, slow motion bounce. So that was user testing. We had a tap in there because it's nice and easy to change, but realized that tap wasn't what we wanted to do because of that. So we changed that to a mouse tap. Here's our counter. And we're also running up to an hour. So we've got the counter being falling and dropping. Why don't we just uh, why don't we just show you the counter and then we'll leave the act the action of the of the dropping and how we filled the cup and how we shook the cup and all that kind of stuff can go into an explore too. Does that sound good? So the counter is just a circle. It doesn't have to be though. That's one of the things that we do in Zim is tend to abstract a lot and make these, you know, we use the gym the gym the zim shapes a lot and uh unfortunately that means that people often will start making things that look like that with the zim shapes uh, go ahead and use an image if you want if you have a little coin in this case it's not really a coin though but if it were a coin don't use a, just a circle actually bring in a, a picture of a coin and use that like make it make it look real make it look professional we tend to uh, use the shapes a lot because uh, that's my style. I like I like abstraction. I'm Dr. Abstract. <laughs> so <laughs> there you go. Uh, doesn't have to be you though. Anyway, we've made a circle. We've located it at the cup's width divided by two. So this is going to be inside the cup. So it's the X and Y inside the cup, which starts at a zero, zero in the top left corner, not the registration point. The registration point has nothing to do with the x, x and y coordinates inside of a, a container. So this is half over and then minus 100 up from its 0, 0 position. So maybe just to make sure that we remember that, here's the cup. I'm going to position it and then put, put the outline back on. Hey, what do you know? OK, so we refresh here. and. This X right here, the cross, that's zero, zero inside of the cup container. This is the registration point where the X and Y on the outside here, on the main stage, the X and Y, that's where it would get positioned. So that's why uh, this is the X and Y of the cup container. From the outside, this is the X and Y inside the cup. So if we want to put this thing right here inside of the cup container, uh, we would want to move it over half of the width of the cup and up 100, not half the width and up 100 from, from here. Okay, But inside it, from 0, 0 inside, that's where we're positioning. Or you could have used posed in there. Pose at uh, 0 from the center, so pose, 0, comma, minus 100, so it would look like this. Here's what the pose inside the cup would look like. Mm, right here. Dot pose, 0, minus 100, comma, from the center of the cup, from the top of the cup, and from the cup. Okay, so that would have worked as well. Posing it, 0 from the center, minus 100 from the top, and in the cup. Let's have a look. Well, just to be sure, we'll go 200, minus 200. A little bit different. There's minus 100, minus 200 is going to be up here. Ooh, uh, yeah. And it's gone. It's actually the distance from the edge of this. The other one was from the center. So loc positions it from the center. So that was uh, 100 up to the center. This is 200 to the edge. I can't remember. I think it's to that edge when it goes negative. I don't know. Maybe, or does that look like it's 200? Does it look like it's 200 to that edge? Might be. Yeah, I think that's more like it. 200 to this edge. And then, so, uh, yeah, most likely. Okay, uh, anyway, we decided to loc that. 
We added a cursor because when we put a mouse down on it, you don't necessarily get a cursor. So we're um, saying, hey, please show a cursor. If we used a tap on this, we would be fine. Uh, same deal here. We ran tap, and then what, what happened is uh, with tap, it was like this. So if we go dot tap. With dot tap, you get the cursor and go drop. Here's repetition in teaching. There we go. So we've added a tap. We don't need the cursor because tap will add the cursor. And let's see what we get here. Darn. Okay, drop three to ten counters in the cup. You ready? I'm going to pick this up and put it in the cup. See what I'm doing? I'm trying to drop this in the cup and it won't go. All you have to do is tap on it. <laughs> That's a tap. But if I try and pick it up and drag it, tap is the wrong thing because they might try this. You never know, especially if they are mobile, they might just swipe this, try and swipe it in. So again, we don't want tap, even though taps you know, what we intended. User testing would see that half the people couldn't make that fall in the cup. <laughs> you know, I try, I try to put this down in the cup. It won't, won't go. So instead we go um, counter dot on mouse down drop and here's what it looks like without the cursor so just to show you we're here on on the pc and mobile really matter. there it is look no cursor I, I can swipe down but i'm not getting a cursor so we bring in the zim cursor this is just any css cursor could be put into there so we refresh here In it comes. Ah, finger. Yeah. And I can swipe it if I want because it's really just mouse down. There you go. Okay. And we're going to see how to make that, uh, how the drop was happening, about various you know things that are happening next. We'll come in on a different Zim Explorer. So I am Dr. Abstract. And this has been Zim Explorer. Tune in to part two. Come join us at zimjs.com slash slack. We'd love to see you there and have a great day. Ciao.